So it will be a special day in the horseshoe on Saturday as the Buckeyes honor their seniors as we welcome in one of our senior members of College Football Weekly team, Tony Gerdman from BuckeyeHuddle.com. Gerd, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Let's talk a little bit about Senior Day. It's, it's been an emotional day in years past, but it's, it's maybe lost a little bit of the luster simply because so many of the very good Ohio State players don't stick around for their fourth, fifth year. And I don't think anyone's anticipating Marvin Harrison Jr. to be back next year, but he certainly won't be walking in the pregame ceremonies on Saturday against Minnesota either. Yeah, you don't get to say goodbye to the seniors in the way that you used to be able to, and they don't. They don't let the juniors walk. And I think also with the the extra COVID year, it's just kind of created this thing where uh, you've got people who are seniors twice. Josh Proctor walked last year, and he's going to walk again. So like, what even is a senior anymore? And the junior is the new senior, but the new seniors don't walk. So it used to be a very, very big deal, a very emotional moment, like shoot back in, the, I think, what, 2012. John Simon for the Michigan game couldn't play, walked out there with a knee the size of a watermelon and, you know, obviously got his ovation. And there, there have been years now where you're like, who's going to be the last guy they announce? Because there is no obvious, this is the last guy that they announce. And I, is it, uh, is it Tommy Eichenberg this year? Like who, who is that guy? I don't know. Speaking of Tommy Eichenberg, I, I think there might be some parallels between Eichenberg and Simon. He's coming off the injury. They held him out over the win against Michigan State because of the, the forearm injury. And Ryan Day thinks he's going to, he's expecting a good week of practice from Tommy Eichenberg. So we might see Tommy Eichenberg against Minnesota, but we also might not. Yeah, I, I wonder what the thought process is in terms of he could have played. Like if this was Michigan, he would have played last week instead of Michigan State. If it was Michigan this week, he would play. How much do they want him to keep the rust off versus they want him to get healthy and not re-aggravate an injury that he's already dealing with? So how much does he play against Minnesota? I think it, it was difficult for him to accept not playing against Michigan State. It would be more difficult to, to not play on senior day. So, yeah, I think you let him dress. You maybe get him out there in the first quarter. But you've got Cody Simon behind him, so that is a luxury that a lot of teams don't have. He has been a starting middle linebacker at Ohio State in the past. But I, I don't know that you want to sit him completely for two weeks and then throw him in, to the Wolves in Ann Arbor. However, being a fifth-year guy, he could probably handle that. The other injury situation for the Buckeyes on the defensive side of the ball, Lathan Ransom, he is not going to play the rest of the regular season. Certainly sounds like he might be able to come back for a bowl game. How much of a hit does that take for the Buckeyes secondary? Yeah, it's a hit. It would have been a bigger hit in years past, but when you lose Lathan Ransom and then replace him with Sonny Styles, that is also a luxury that most teams don't have. So they'll go with Sonny just as they did this past week and He's very effective. He's had two really good games playing different, uh, having different responsibilities. What it does do, though, is uh, it alters some of the stuff that they would do with Sonny Styles when he was the nickel. And so now they're going to have to figure out what they can do with that while also bringing along Jihad Carter, perhaps behind Sonny as a strong safety that can come in when they want to do some stuff closer to closer to the line of scrimmage with Sonny Styles. But he's a guy that can do a lot of different things. But as Ryan Day said, they don't want to ask him to do too much. But he has such versatility that you've got to have him do some different things that keep uh, an offense on their toes. I'm always very interested to see the coaches' demeanors leading up to games. And normally when we hear from Jim Knowles on Tuesday, he's kind of tight-lipped and very serious. But this past Tuesday, he was kind of loose, feeling good. And we found out the statistic that Jim Knowles is most concerned with. Yeah, the, his, his favorite statistic is stop rate, which is the, the rate at which you stop an opponent from scoring. And if you think about it, uh, games come down to points, and if you're not allowing points, then the better you're at, you are at a stop rate, the better you're going to be doing in terms of eliminating points. And so um, that's that's his number one thing, and doesn't stat, like sacks. He used to, he said it before, he used to care about sacks used to care about other things, but you can get sacks on first and second down and you give up a big play on third down and what did those sacks do for you? So keeping the opponent out of the end zone is the end all be all for all defensive guys. It's just a matter of how you go about doing it. But to your first point there, he was a very different 
uh, Jim Knowles. Now we've seen him like this in bits and pieces, but he was uh, almost like he was on stage for the better part of 30 minutes and playing to a crowd. Uh, I think it was maybe a week or two ago. He was very serious and he gave some short answers. And in this one, you know, he was joking around and really seemed to be having a good time and just seemed to be in a really good mood. And I think anytime you have a coach that is in a good mood, that is indicative of the people he has around him and the players he has around him and the level of concern that he has or doesn't, not that he isn't concerned, but he's feeling pretty confident about his guys. But also it's not a point to where you're cocky or you're like, well, we've got this in the bag because that's not it at all either. But I think there's a level of comfort with what he's got. Certainly coming off of the win over Michigan State in which the Buckeyes only allowed three points. That ties their season low. The first game against Indiana, they only allowed a field goal. And the, the one field goal that Michigan State got was a 50-yarder. So this was an Ohio State defense down three starters that held the Spartans to just three points. And certainly we know Michigan State's offense has struggled quite a bit. Yet at the same time, the Spartans were able to effectively run the ball against Ohio State, particularly in the first quarter. Yeah, they had some some big plays in the first quarter. We've seen other teams have some success for a drive in the first half, but the the experience that this Ohio State defense has, even the depth of the experience, because like you said, there are there were three starters out, but they are still able to um, fix things on the fly. They don't even necessarily need to wait until halftime. They can fix it on the fly because everybody knows the defense. They know the purpose of their roles, the purpose of the defense what their teammates are doing and what they should be doing in relation to that. So it's something that they can, Jim Knowles can say, let's start doing this instead. And everybody knows what that means and he can communicate it quickly and they know why they're doing it. And they're moving fast because they know what they're doing. There's no, there are no questions. They all have this understanding of what the, what the point of each defensive play call is. And so they're able to just flip a switch and, just cut things off and stop the flow of certain big plays. Other side of the ball, Buckeyes completely healthy. We saw that against Michigan State, perhaps the best the offense has looked all season long as the O-line gelling a little bit better, but you had a healthy Travion Henderson, a healthy uh, Cade Stover, Marvin Harrison Jr. pushing his Heisman campaign, and Emeka Abuka not 100%, but continue to get closer and closer. Is the offense finally clicking at the exact right time? Yeah, I think so. Getting healthier and clicking and I asked both Ryan Day and Jim Knowles are that you have to play your best in November is the offense is the defense playing its best in November and both said yes. And when you watch that first half, you can see it. And even the the way they're using Xavier Johnson now in the two back sets and what they're doing with that is very interesting. So they've got a lot of guys that can use and we still haven't seen Emeka Buka truly utilized to his fullest at this point. And maybe that's something that they're not necessarily saving, but building towards for Michigan because he's one of the top receivers in the nation and obviously a guy that you want to get involved, especially if they're, if teams are going to continue to try to double Marvin Harrison. If you've got another guy on the other side or in that same area that is as effective as a Mecca Buka, then that just, that's another weapon for Kyle McCord, who is getting more and more comfortable and when he has these options, it's not a thing where he's got happy feet just waiting for Marv to break open because he can go to Kate Stover. He can go to Mecca. He can go to Marv. He can dump it off to Trevion Henderson. He can throw to Julian Fleming. All of these are viable and legitimate options. And you don't just have to wait for Marvin to find a crease. And I think earlier in the season, there may have been some of that where Kyle was just force feeding Marvin a little bit. And uh, now, now you're just feeding everybody. McCord coming off a career high for both completions and passing yards in that win over Sparty. Marvin Harrison Jr. clearly in the Heisman Trophy conversation. What does he need to do to secure a invitation to New York City? What does he need to do to perhaps win the Heisman Trophy? Yeah, I think you have a big game against Michigan with a couple of touchdowns and you win the game against Michigan. Everybody's going to be watching that game for a thousand different reasons. And if one of the things they come away from that game talking about is Marvin Harrison, then that's going to carry over to the Heisman ballot. And right now you're seeing him in terms of like maybe the third or fourth betting favorite, depending on where you're looking. And, you know, obviously he needs to have some more scores on Saturday and do what he did. 
Um, even uh, the game against Rutgers, he had like four catches for 25 yards, but two of those are touchdowns. And I don't think that has hampered him. So not that they want another one of those games, which is four catches for 25 yards, but I, they're going to continue to utilize them. I thought it was funny because they sure seemed like they came into that game against Michigan State wanting to get him scores, wanting to get him involved, wanting to prop him up for the Heisman. And then when Ryan Day was asked about it after the game, he's like, no, we don't think about that at all. You know, we're just looking for the best ways to win. And granted, throwing the ball to Marvin Harrison, giving the ball to Marvin Harrison on an end around, those are very good ways to win. But it sure seemed like there is also another purpose to that. Minnesota Golden Gophers come into the shoe on Saturday. Gophers, uh, middle of the pack in the Big Ten West, which certainly isn't all that impressive. They are very similar to Michigan in many ways. Certainly there's a bigger talent gap. Michigan is a much better team than Minnesota. But I think schematically there are some very similar things to the two programs. So playing Minnesota the week before playing Michigan might be a pretty good thing for Ohio State. Yeah, and Ryan Day also compared them to, or Jim Knowles compared them to the Rutgers offense as well, where they're very physical. And that physicality has me wondering if maybe it is a better idea to have Tommy Eichenberg take the week off because you know it is going to be a rough and tumble game you are going to be facing six and seven offensive linemen. They are going to try to run the ball 40 times a game. They don't necessarily need to throw, but they'll pull some uh, some play actions out of there and try to hit, just keep the chains moving. So it's a very physical, well-coached attack with you know some limitations at quarterback. And I think uh, you said middle of the pack in the Big Ten West. I think the Big Ten West is the middle of the pack. Like, I don't know, even if you're at the top of the pack, you're still technically in the middle. And Minnesota is right in there. but They've got guys that that um, can keep things alive in the way they coach. They know the coaches know their limitations, so they coach to it, and they try not to make that hurt them. They try to get around it. Defensively, they're going to be very smart as well. So, I, obviously, I think Ohio State's talent has, is is a big advantage, but you can't just, as they say, just throw the helmets out there. Minnesota head coach PJ Fleck once on Jim Trussell's staff at Ohio State. His main job getting Coach Trust his lunch every day as Ohio State Buckeyes will try to hand the Gophers their lunch on Saturday. I want to thank our guest Tony Gerdman from BuckeyeHuddle.com for his insights on Ohio State, Minnesota, and so much more. Thanks, Gerd. Thank you for having me as always.